All right. Uh, it's time to get started because he's checking in from his palatial estate uh, at Beacon Orthopedics. We'll have him lined up here in a moment. But we mentioned our big interview today is Dr. Timothy Kremchek, one of the most well-known and respected surgeons uh, in the United States. So yes, he's operated on the likes of Ken Griffey Jr. and Barry Larkin, but most of his work over the last 35 years has been done on people just like you and me. He operated on one of my knees a number of years ago. He started and owns Beacon Orthopedics in his hometown of Cincinnati, where his father, Edward, was also a renowned, a renowned doctor. He was recently named as one of the top 10 doctors in Major League Baseball, but is considered to be one of the two or three top surgeons in the sport, especially when a pitcher needs Tommy John surgery. Kremchek served a fellowship under Dr. James Andrews, who certainly helped his rise in the field. For those in Cincinnati, his generosity in the community and his commitment to young people is really unmatched anywhere. Every Friday night, every Friday night for 35 years, you'll see him walking up and down the sidelines of a local high school football game or on a Tuesday night at a girls' soccer game. That's been going on for decades. He and his wife, Hillary, recently donated the brand-new baseball field at famed Cincinnati Moeller High School where he and his father have served as the school's team doctors going all the way back to the 1960s. We mentioned a moment ago, he's also been on a crusade to save the arms of young pitchers, your sons, your daughters, your grandsons, your granddaughters. And his views are certainly sought out by medical experts and baseball coaches all over the country. And for a little fun, he's also medically served Rock and rollers like the Rolling Stones and Kiss. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But Dr. Kremchek, good morning. Hope you're doing well today. Doing well uh, today. Have you been in surgery or just seeing patients today? What do you have going on? Just seeing patients today. Today's a lot, one of my lighter days. Yesterday was a surgery day. How many, how many surgeries would you do in one day like yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday, I think I did 14. And but those are a little bit of everything? Uh, of everything? Yeah, ACLs, uh, we call ladder J's, big open shoulder procedures, uh, Tommy John's, rotator cuff repairs, you know, kind of a the gamut. All right, I'm going to ask you, I assume he's got his audio on his computer, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so if you can hit that mute button, then that way we don't hear my voice over and over. It makes enough people sick as it is. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I mentioned when you were growing up, and I think a lot of us, I certainly uh, assume this, that you were a lifelong born and raised Cincinnati. And we mentioned your father, a doctor growing up, but your first baseball experience actually came in Boston, right? My father was at Westover Air Force Base. We lived in Chicopee, Massachusetts, and I was a diehard Red Sox fan. We're talking about 1967 when the Red Sox went to the World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals, Bob Gibson. I can tell you the entire lineup for both teams, for uh, St. Louis and, 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 and Boston. Big, huge Red Sox fan. Loved Carl Yastrzemski, Tony Canigliaro, Kenda Hawk Harrelson. I used to go to bed at night listen to uh, uh, my radio with one of those little white uh, earphones and, and put it underneath my pillow. So absolutely. And I mean, it... I started with baseball that way until we moved to Cincinnati in 1968 when my father went into practice. And the first thing he did was an 805 Reds, Cardinals, Bob Gibson on the mound against Jerry Arrigo and the Cincinnati Reds at Crossley Field <laughs> on, on a bobblehead night. By the way, it was a bobblehead night. Come on. They had bobbleheads in the 1960s? Well, no, no, this was the late 60s, and it was a Cincinnati Reds, Mr. Red bobblehead. Gotcha. Okay. So it wasn't okay. a, yeah. And so, but yeah, I mean, this 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 went all the way, and that's when I started. I played baseball back then as, as, a, as a five-year-old, loved the game, uh, actually loved the Red Sox. I mean, I'll never forget uh, going, my father, when I was nine years old, took, it was a two-hour drive to Fenway Park. And after the game, we went down behind Fenway Park, and where the players would come out, Jim Lomborg and all these guys were coming out. All I wanted was an autograph. Well, my father, I couldn't get them. It was packed. And my father wrote a letter to Mr. Yockey at the time. It said, my nine-year-old son, it's his birthday, and, and nothing. So all of a sudden, a few weeks later, there's this ball that's signed by every member of the, of the Boston Red Sox. 
it was actually my father who signed it. I just had no idea the signature was the same. The <laughs> names were just different. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, you, you moved to Cincinnati. You talked about your dad, uh, a, a real uh, pioneer in sports uh, medicine and sports procedures. Uh, he, he gets involved with Moeller High School. And at that time, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that's right around the time when Jerry Faust is the head football coach at Moeller. Do you remember meeting him, being around him, any of that kind of thing growing up? Oh, guys. Yeah, there's a guy named Hank Sanciola, who was a primary care doctor, whose sons ended up going to Moeller High School, and he would take care of them uh, probably, it started in the late 60s. Well, back then, sports medicine was an infancy, and they didn't have orthopedists that took care of teams, but my father loved it. I mean, he, I mean, he got to meet Jerry. Jerry was so engaging, so into this. The Moeller program was, you know, was eight years into its uh the beginnings and Jerry Faust was just a huge part of my my growing up uh, Jerry <laughs> Jerry and my father became very very good friends I mean it's every Saturday morning during the football season the phone would ring around 7 7 30 that's when we had phones not cell phones and it was Jerry on the phone with that raspy voice going Doug I got these players and he'd bring them over to the house around nine o'clock there'd be about eight of them and these guys were man mountains standing there and you know, Jerry just wanted to make sure that they were going to be okay, what they needed to do so they could play and, and move on. And, I mean, it was the beginning of a relationship that uh, you know, all of us wish we had with our high schools and our programs of trust and getting these kids back and doing things for the right reason. But, oh, yeah, Jerry Faust was a huge personality. That went to a, not to get ahead of myself here, but when Jerry was given a job or got the job to go to Notre Dame, he wanted to take my father with him to be the, the doctor at Notre Dame. No kidding. Did your dad yeah. think about did your dad that? Think about that. He did. I mean, what a great honor! But us being in school and and you know, I have five, three brothers. Uh, we were growing up here. Probably wasn't the right thing to do for the family. And in retrospect, it certainly wasn't the right thing to do. So thinking of us, but you know, he loved Moeller football. It was back then. It was Princeton Moeller. Uh, these games were incredible. Uh, even though I didn't go to Moeller, I went to Indian Hill. <laughs> I never forget when I was a freshman. Uh, my dad said, Jerry wants you to come up to practice and because he wanted me to go to Moeller. I mean, if I went to Moeller, things would have been a lot simpler, just and the access, everything. So I go up there and I'll never forget. There's old Tim Cagle, Bob Craig. I think that's what a sophomore. Bob Craigable was a freshman, uh, big Jim Brown, the offensive line, a guy named Paul Messong. I'm looking at these guys saying, <laughs> it's, I might be on the team. But there is not a chance I'm going to make it through practice. And so I, I stayed at Indian Hill and played, and I think it was better for my health. Let's just put it that way. You were a very good baseball player, and you decided to go play at Wittenberg. H had you already decided, maybe long before you went to college, that you were going to follow in your father's footsteps? You know, all of us, everybody, you ask any kid now, and I ask all these kids when they come to my office, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they all want to be I mean, the little guys. They all want to be baseball players, football players, basketball players. That's what I wanted to do. I loved baseball. I loved the game. I mean, I was a huge, you know, when we moved to Cincinnati, huge Cincinnati Reds fan. Uh, I, you know, all of the players, you know, Bench, Rose, Morgan, Perez, uh, all of these guys. I mean, I watched every game on TV, used to go to a ton of games. Uh, that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, you, you, you go to school like Indian Hill and you're pretty good. And I ended up going to Wittenberg and getting to play relatively early. But I, I recognized pretty soon after that that uh, that was going to be the end of my baseball career. And I had to do something else. I, quite honestly, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And uh, my father said, why don't you come and my grades weren't the greatest my first year. He said, why don't you come and work with me uh, over Christmas break? And I did. And I spent six weeks. I'd go to the operating room, see patients. I saw how he did what he did, why he did what he did. And after that day, I said, I want to be a sports doctor. That's what I want to be. Uh, I didn't know what kind. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I wanted to be a sports doctor. I wanted to be involved with sports, involved with the team, be a part of everything that, that they did. And it wasn't until I got to Boston, which really turned my life around uh, as far as what I want to do, how I wanted to do it, who I met. And uh, it, after that, it was just it's, it's just been a whirlwind. Up in Boston. 
Well, I was a fourth year medical student. I got into medical school, knew this is what I wanted to do. And I did a rotation at the New England Baptist Hospital, which was a uh, affiliate of Harvard. Well, obviously that was in off Parker Hill Avenue and it was about three miles from Fenway Park. But one of the reasons I wanted to go there because I love, I was thinking of doing my residency there. And so on a Saturday, the nighttime, I would go down to the ballpark. Well, one night I was, this is 1985, uh, July of 85, I spent a month. And I'm standing down where the players go in and this lady with gray hair and dark glasses said to me, you look like you're lost, you have a ticket. I mean, I was in a polo shirt, and blue jeans, you know, I looked like a regular guy. And it was Mrs. Yaki. And she took me up to her box and we sat up there and watched the game. And the next night she invited me again. She asked me what I wanted to do. She, downstairs, she met me, there was a guy named, I think Lou Gorman was his name. He was the general manager, introduced me to him. And that was the year, and, and they, they were really getting into sports medicine. I said, this is what I want to do. I want to take care of a baseball team, not the Red Sox. I want to take care of the Reds. And so I did my residency there, and I used to ride my bicycle to Fenway Park to watch the players come in. And there was a guy named Roger Clemens that was a pitcher for the Red Sox, and he was getting his shoulder arthroscope by some guy named Jim Andrews. And I said, who's he? And I researched him and said, I'm going to finish here. And I'm going to go and spend a year in Alabama and learn how to take care of baseball players from this guy. Because this guy was, you know, an up and coming guy in 1989. And I said, that's what I want to do. And after that, I stalked him, spent a year with him. He taught me everything I wanted to, to learn about baseball. And I said, I want to be him. That was my next question for you that I had written down here, uh, it, James Andrews. He, he's become, certainly in the medical field, the sports medical field especially, um, a, a household name. Uh, maybe after Dr. Frank Job, he's become the next guy, and then you would be the next guy after that. I, I think when, you know, if there's such a thing as an arms race, uh, no pun intended, uh, if a pitcher has to have Tommy John surgery, they're talking to you and they're talking to James Andrews. Um, what what is it about him or any doctor, Tim, that 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 separates them from the pack, especially when it comes to a procedure like Tommy John? Well, you know that's a great question because you know when you're in the medical field, everybody you want to think everybody's top notch and everybody can do a great job. I think the difference is in what he taught me. And I, my father taught me in retrospect a little bit of this too, but what Jim Andrews, who I think is a second father, by the way, he taught me the art of sports medicine. And I, I say this to my fellows all the time. It's not about what you do, it's how you do it. And you have to respect the player, respect what he's doing, respect why he wants, wants to do it, whatever level that may be. And, and, and once you understand that and you've got that connection, then that gives you a step up of everybody, uh, upon everybody else. I mean, a lot of docs stop playing. If it hurts, don't do it. Just quit. Don't play that sport anymore. Understanding what makes these kids and what makes them tick. And once you do that, you can hone in on some of these procedures that may be a little more difficult for some to do. Then you become good at it. You become their advocate. And you become a player's advocate because deep down, that's what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to be a player. All of us have some competitive athletic uh, approach to life and so to be part of all this and work and get down the the roller coaster with them I don't care if it's a high school football player I don't care if it's Tommy John I don't care if it's a you know a, a college basketball player it doesn't matter as long as you understand and appreciate where they're coming from you've got a connection with them that most docs don't Jim Andrews taught me that I, he he had the most unbelievable approach to people I mean he was a southern guy I was uh, from training in Boston I was a Yankee and he'd come in with these with these players. How you doing, big man? How y'all doing? And they'd say, we were just in there with this Yankee here. And he goes, ah, he's all right. He's only here for a year. I'm teaching him. We go back up north when we're done. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had a chance to meet him. He, he, he's, a, he's a piece of work. I don't know him well, but he, he's a piece of work. When, when you, you were in your early 30s, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, when you became... Uh, the top medical guy, medical director uh, of the Cincinnati Reds. How did that happen? You know, it's funny. Uh, when I started practice, uh, I came back up from Birmingham and I started taking care of the Cincinnati Cyclone hockey team. And they had an affiliate in Birmingham, the Birmingham Bulls. 
But the Cincinnati Cyclone hockey team back then, they were at the Gardens. They were selling 11,000 a night. Games are sold out. I mean, it was the ticket in town. And I was able to work and become the doctor for that team. Well, what happened was, is that a sports, what I learned in Birmingham was the approach. I didn't learn this in Boston. Boston was staunch, Harvard, white coat. They didn't get it. But in Birmingham, they understood how to take care of athletes. Well, the word got around how I took care of the hockey team. I'd go to practice every now and then, take care of the players. And right about then, the Reds were in this metamorphosis. And uh, Jim Bowden was the general manager. And he called me on the phone and he said, uh, you trained with Jim Andrews and you love baseball. I want to talk to you. And I spent three hours in December of 1996, actually yeah, early December. And he asked me what you want to do. And I said, my dream job is to take care of the Cincinnati Reds. I said, I'll come to spring training. I'll come to every game. I'll show you how it's done. He didn't believe me, but he said, you're on, you're hired. And uh, from 1996 and, until now, that's what I've been doing. So uh, it, it was an unbelievable interview. And I know Jim's got his uh, uh, fans and people that don't like him very much, but he was very fair to me. But I think what he was trying to do was find a connection to the team. And I'll tell you, the guy that was my biggest advocate back then was Barry Larkin. And Barry Larkin wanted health care for the team. He wanted the players to be taken care of. He wanted them to be prioritized. And um, I, I got the job in 96 and we went down to Plant City, uh, Florida. It was our first spring, my first spring training, the last one for the Reds in Plant City. And I was scared to death. And uh, the first guy that came up to me was the reigning MVP of 1996 was Barry Larkin in front of the whole group. Gave me a big hug and said, I'm glad you're here. That was it. Walk us through, uh, I've seen it in, in person, we're going to get to this Tommy John stuff in, in, in a few minutes, but, but, but walk us through what you and your staff do and how it's evolved certainly over the years. But I mean, now when you're the medical director of a professional sports team and baseball, which has you know, dozens of minor league teams, you have hundreds of minor league players, you ultimately, at least from a macro standpoint, at the very start of spring training, have to go in there and look at these guys and check them out. So when you get, when you get to Goodyear, Arizona now, you and your staff, tell us what that's like hitting the ground running. Well, first of all, you don't want to hit blind. You've got to, you've got to go down to spring training and know exactly what you're getting into, what players are coming, what problems they've had, who's going to be valuable to the team and who isn't, who are fillers for the minor leagues. I mean, these are all things that you've got to be able to communicate really months ahead of time, look at their records and find out kind of where they're going to shake out. Then once you've got a list of the, you know, the top 35 guys, maybe 40, and then you've got your prospects that you'll know that'll be in the minor leagues, but, but have to be healthy. Then you've got to, you've got to set up your team to be able to do cursory examinations and then specific examinations on specific body parts. And so it takes a, a fair amount of time to look, for example, the pitcher's shoulder, his elbow, get the right questions asked, go back and look at old MRIs, old surgical procedures, surgical notes, whether they've been, how much time they've been on the disabled list. Because at the end of the day, you have to be able to sit down with the organization and say, this guy is going to last. This guy is not going to pitch 200 innings. This guy is not going to be a reliever. This guy is going to break down. And this is uh, somebody that we're not going to be able to rely on. Or this is the guy we need to develop his arm strength, shut him down uh, if we got him from a trade uh, first half of the year, and he'll be available for us for the second half. So there's a lot of scrutiny. There's a lot of questions. It's a lot of stress because, you know, the front office is asking they, their jobs depend on them getting the right answers and putting the right players out there to perform with the right program for, for now and for the future. So it's, it's a lot of work. You got that job as medical director of the Reds, and, and, and you're continuing to build your quote unquote resume and reputation as a, as a surgeon. Um, is there one guy, Tim, that puts you kind of uh, on the map of a surgery you did? Uh, it could be a pitcher, it could be a position player, I don't know, that, that all of a sudden, by word of mouth or whatever it might be, that all of a sudden let people out there know just beyond Cincinnati or the Cincinnati Reds that if you've got a problem, this is a guy you might want to come see. The, the agents are the ones that – the players, but also the agents are the ones that send you a lot of business. And so years ago, the Levinsons, who were with Aces, would send me all of their players. And I, I, I go back 25 years with 
you know, Detroit Tigers, Oakland A's. You know, I think Barry Lark and Kevin Mitchell helped Paul, um, our, our, um, our first baseman, was um, 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 uh, planking on his name now, um, uh, on the World Series team. All these Brett Boone, these are all guys that I took care of when I first started and, and who were very receptive to my care. But the guy that probably put me on the map, the guy that put me on the map nationally was Ken Griffey Jr. And I never forget when Junior came, I was sitting in the OR and I heard that we're going to sign him and Mr. Linder drove him to the press conference. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to be a circus. This guy's going to be untouchable. But Junior Griffey and I bonded from day one. And I'll never forget this, never. So one, he's an icon, obviously, not only in Cincinnati, but across the country. So he's in San Francisco and he goes to catch a fly ball and he injures his hamstring okay trainers are calling me we're rehabbing his hamstring it's a couple weeks later i'm driving in my car and it's junior calling and he said my hamstring is not better i think i need an mri and i said junior we don't mri hamstrings we don't do any we don't operate on them but i said you're junior we're going to get an mri so we get an mri and the hamstring is pulled completely off the bone and it's hip it's like wow it's completely torn well i have never fixed one of those and so I looked it up and did my research and I sent him down with our trainer to the head uh, of sports medicine at the University of uh, North Carolina. And he had done a number of these on the women's soccer players and fixed them. So Junior goes down and the next day I'm sitting in my office, I get a knock on the door. It's Junior. He goes, the doctor said I need it fixed. When are we doing it? I said, what are you, I, I haven't done it. He goes, I trust you. I want you to do this. That was 48 hours of advanced studying for me. <laughs> And so I fixed his hamstring. And after that, uh, it was all he came back and won comeback player of the year the next year. Everybody in the world knew he had it fixed. Uh, it was all over the papers back then, all over everything. And so I think if one guy put me on a map, it was Ken Griffey Jr. Isn't that kind of funny? Isn't that funny that a hamstring yeah. injury uh, and a hamstring repair would be the one that put you on the map? Not, I mean, like I said, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you fixed Ken Griffey Jr.'s hamstring, you fixed Tom Brenneman's knee, you, you fixed Joe Blow's elbow, but, but, but you become more known as the years go by as a Tommy John guy. I find it so interesting that it's a hamstring that really puts you on the map. You know, it is interesting, but nobody wanted to fix that. It was a unique injury in and in a megastar, a guy who's an all-century player who decided to, amongst anybody in the world to go to, to stay with me. And he came back and he did well. And so all of the things that you've learned, the things that Jim Andrews taught me how to do with Tommy Johns, then all of a sudden the players start looking at you differently. And so, oh my gosh, I mean, I get down the list of, of guys that we started that would, one of my big, the, the pride of taking, the hard part about taking care of a professional team, there's a lot of agents and a lot of people that hang around these players. Well, you've got to develop that trust. And if they trust you, the players will want to stay. It's easier. Their families are here. You know, everything is in, in town. If they don't trust you, they leave. And, and sometimes they don't have a choice. The agents push them wherever they want to go. But for a long period of time here, I was the go-to guy, not only for our players, but for a lot of players around the league. And it seems like every year there's more and more and more. And, and, and in pitchers, the Tommy John happens to be the, you know, the, the, the buzzword. Everybody wants to learn what it is, how to do it, how do they come back. Now it's the revision Tommy Johns. And so I would see knee injuries, ACLs, all that kind of stuff. But the thing that got the fame and the, and the, and the newspaper articles and the reports were the Tommy John. And, and then as I've done an awful lot of those. Is there pressure or do you feel pressure even now? I'm sure the Ken Griffey Jr. thing, there's no doubt what the answer would be yes. But is there, do you feel pressure when you're operating on a big time athlete whose career is in the balance, perhaps, depending on his recovery, him or her, uh, from a surgery? And everybody knows you're the guy doing the surgery. Yes. Uh, and, and it gets worse because the more you're known, I mean, orthopedics is a very cutthroat. Everybody wants, everybody wants to do what I do. Nobody wants, not a lot of people want to put in the time and the effort to do what I do. And so you take a lot of pride in it. A lot of things can go wrong. You need an awful lot of people around you to support what you do, whether it be anesthesia, nurses, assistants, you know, people that work in the office. I think it's, uh, 
the more you think about those things, yes, it, it, there's a lot of pressure because everybody wants to shoot you down. Everybody wants to see you fail. Everybody wants to see, uh, you know, them jump in front of you. And so that's what motivates me, though. It's, and, and again, I think when you take care of a sports team, you take care of athletes, it's your athletic the, the competitor of you that comes out. You want to be involved with teams that win. You want to be involved, win or lose, with them as part of the team. And you want to be part of the success stories that gets people back out there playing and watch them play. I don't care if it's Clevenger or Bassett or Souza or uh, Nick Senzel or Joey Votto, whoever it is. Uh, you watch them. You want to see them succeed because part of you is going through that athletic competition with them. It's 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 your way of playing and competing when you can't do it anymore. Um, but, but I know you feel that way because, again, I, I'm, I'm a living example of this. It, it, it's not only the, the surgery itself and the surgery being successful. It also takes then follow-up care uh, and for the individual, whether it's somebody like me or somebody that plays high school soccer or uh, Ken Griffey Jr., um, the follow-up, uh, and I tell people all the time because I've had – surgery on both knees and I'm not an athlete in any form or fashion but the follow-up work is what separates and, and I'm asking you this is a question it seems to me that the commitment now that comes on that person because you're going to give them the chance to rehab everything uh, and, and again it doesn't matter whether you're the high school athlete or you're a Ken Griffey Jr. at Beacon you're going to give them a chance to rehab it but you better show up and you better be committed to it because it seems to me that's just as important as the surgery itself. Is that fair? fair? Absolutely. And, you know, where a lot of people, I think where a lot of people fail is not understanding that it's not just about me. It's about it's about your team. It, it's no different. My team here is no different than any other sports team. I mean, Tom Brady doesn't win without his offensive line, his tailbacks, and his receivers. I don't win without my assistants, my physical therapists, my athletic trainers, the people in the OR. And so you have to develop a team of people that understand what it takes to get to get somebody to that next level. I don't care if you're doing a knee replacement on somebody. You don't treat them like they're old. You treat them like they want to get back to the activity that they want to do. Um, and you have to have that mindset and you have to develop that culture. And the culture that we developed here is for these athletes to get them back on the field to play. I don't, again, I don't care what gender, age, level, sport, it doesn't matter whatever they want to do. And once you can develop that culture and have the people around you understand that culture, the immediacy to get an MRI, to understand a diagnosis, to get the treatment, get the rehab, and then functionally get them safely back on the field, communicating with the coaches and oftentimes the coaches in college that they're going to go, it's going that extra mile and it's being a part of their injury, their program, their progress, and their success. And if you can do that, this isn't a job. This is something you do and you just enjoy every day. And I love every second of it. And I think if you understand that, that's what separates some from others uh, in this field. It's not just about doing arthroscopic surgery or Tommy John. It's about understanding and just totally devoting yourself uh, to the people that come in to see you. And, and sometimes that detracts from your family life. It's some of the other stuff you want to do for fun. But it, uh, it makes your career awfully, uh, uh, to me, rewarding. You have taken it upon yourself, uh, or perhaps prodded by, by all the patients you see, and I mentioned at the outset that of the overwhelming majority, uh, probably 90-something percent, uh, are the surgeries. You said you did 14 yesterday. Uh, you know, maybe none of them plays professional sports. Um, young pitchers growing up, teenagers, Pitching in knot hole, high school pitchers, college pitchers. You've become quite the um, leader in the way you feel about how these young men and or women, maybe in softball, I don't know, maybe the throwing underneath is not as devastating to the arm as coming from over the top. Um, but, but you've become a, a real advocate for trying to educate people on how much these young people should be used or not be used. Um, what's been the reception out there? Because let's face it, I don't care if you're a high school team, a college team, pro team, you're trying to win and you want your best guys out there. Yes. And, and again, I understand that and I appreciate that. 
And I think that if I have a, an audience, it's going to be for the overhead thrower because that's just kind of what I do, the pitching, the throwing, the baseball. But I like to take this to the level of not just baseball, but I'm talking about youth sports in general. One of my big criticisms is how not necessarily competitive, but cutthroat. And I think that it, 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 for the reasons to just win, we are putting aside some of the safety factors of our youngsters, whether it be young women soccer players, uh, whether it be the types of fields we play on, whether it be baseball players and how types of pitches they throw, how often they throw, we have to be advocates to safely get them to play. And what has turned me off on a lot of these competitive uh, leagues, sports, is the is the all-out effort to win at the expense of some of these kids' safety. And, and, and to the forefront of it comes the Tommy John surgery and throwing breaking balls, for example, kids that are 12 years old. And we've known forever, and this is where it started, we've known forever that the younger you are and how you start to throw curveballs throws a lot of stress on your shoulder and in, in particular your elbow. And we've seen research, we've watched it, we know that you've got to grip the ball a different way, you've got to learn to throw it the right way, and if you don't, you have a real chance of, of causing damage to yourself a couple of years down the road. Well, when all that literature started being developed for Little League Baseball, the Little League World Series and Little League Baseball is so political that they threw it away and tried to justify that throwing curveballs cannot be proven to cause injury when you're 12 because of the sensationalism, the TV, ESPN, Little League World Series, and I became then a staunch, I'm going against, I'm going against I don't care what you guys say, and I took a lot of backlash for that. Uh, no different than the same backlash I'm taking now but talking about field turf, I know field turf causes injury. I know it causes more injury than natural turf. And the NFL wants to sit and they want to deny that. They want to deny that those, those, those studies exist, and they do. And it's not just for the NFL. We're talking about now going down to the high school level, the women's soccer levels. We're talking about baseball. So I want to be able to get the word out how we can play these sports safer how these kids can move on. You asked me, taking care of professional athletes is one thing. The most important thing and the hardest thing I do is take care of these young kids that want to go on to play ball in college and, they, and they're and they playing in high school. I have, My goal is to get them ready so they can go enjoy college. Some of them can't afford college unless they do play a sport. Some of them, that's who they are. That That's going to develop them as people. And so it, the, the Reds and professional athletes are one thing. But the hardest job I have is these young kids, so I can keep them on the, the straight and narrow, staying you know, with the right people, doing the right thing. It's going to develop them for the rest of their lives. So, yeah, I've taken a lot of criticism. I've been beat up a lot uh, because of this, but I'll stand strong. I don't care. And most of the reception is quite good until it gets down to the bottom line. And the problem are some of the coaches and some of the leagues. The parents have been unbelievable. There's a very dangerous narrative out there, Tim with younger players and pitchers about being proactive in regard to having Tommy John. How frequently are you dealing with that? In other words, getting a Tommy John, because so many guys are coming back stronger, throwing harder after a Tommy John surgery. So getting it done before you even get hurt. You know, that's I've, I've been asked a number of times by coaches, parents, I've been asked by two general managers in professional baseball uh, to do that. Uh, one of them was a Dominican player that threw hard, and they knew they were going to blow out his elbow, so let's just fix it. And I absolutely 100% of the time is no. And again, one of our jobs is educating. People hurt themselves because of fatigue, technique, uh, many, many reasons, but you, but the reason, and again, guys like me want to sit back and take credit for somebody having a Tommy John and then becoming a National League Player of the Year, it has nothing to do with me. You fix the elbow, but it's the rehabilitative program, the strengthening of the core, the shoulder, the long toss program, the time and effort that's going to make them better, stronger pitchers. And I tell them that all the time. It has nothing to do with what I do. It has everything to do with what they do. And most of these young kids... And, or, and, and you see, see it all the time. They jump out of their parents' car, they go play. They don't warm up, they don't long toss, they don't do anything. Now, all of a sudden, they played for 15 years. They've never taken any time off of baseball. We operate on them. They're going to miss 9 to 12 months. And that whole time, they're building their body up, their core, their shoulder. So, of course, they come back and they throw harder. So that's the message we need. We need to educate people. 
our goal and my job, as much as it's a surgeon and operating and standing on the sidelines, whatever it might be, is to educate and mostly to educate the kids, the coaches, and their parents. Um, um, well, walk me through, Tim, where it became in vogue. And I don't know if you're a proponent of this or not. Based on everything you just said, uh, uh, it would be easy to assume which side you would come down on. But look, you and I are old enough to remember, and I was broadcasting not all that long ago, where guys like Greg Maddox and Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson and Roger Clemens, and I could go on and on and on. You'd have 25 or 30 guys in each league that are throwing 250 innings, if their teams make it to the postseason, they're throwing 300 innings. You're lucky to find two or three guys in each league now that even get to 200 innings in a season. Where did – what prompted this – I'm going to call it babying. Maybe you want to yell and scream at me for using that word. Where did we start babying pitchers? And I, and I use the Kevin Cash uh, thing from the World Series – a couple of years ago. You got a dominant starter. You're playing in the World Series. This is Major League Baseball, man. This isn't some high school regional game. And you're taking a guy out of a game because he's got 100 pitches? Where did that all start? A, a lot. For, first of all, number one, we do know that injury comes from fatigue. And, and when you talk about injuries in baseball players, you talk about stressful innings and non-stressful innings. And that's why closers break down, I think, a lot faster than starters and, and middle relievers. Uh, but it all started, I mean, if you go back to when I was telling you about the 60s, you talk about the 69 Mets, they had four pitchers. All these guys had four four pitching rotations. The problem came with the agents, the money, uh, and the longevity of these players and, and, and how in their minds they can protect their arms. I think a lot of these guys, and Jack McKeon taught me this many years ago, are not throwing enough. And if they are, they're not thrown properly enough. We know that long tossing and building your arm strength can help can, it can help you, you know, stay pitching longer. But I think a lot of this are the people that are surrounding these players. The money is big. The TV money is big. Uh, and in their minds, they're trying to do and save their commodity uh, by limiting the amount they pitch. And sometimes I think they hurt the players. And there's a lot of players, or some I should say, that feel that going back to a four-man rotation in baseball is a, a better thing. That they throw every fourth day, they're going to do better. And, and we've watched the Jim Maloney's grow up, throw 200 pitches in a game, pitch forever. We, we watched Nolan Ryan forever. You know, Jerry Kuzman. I can go through, the like you can, the entire list of guys that were throwing 200 innings and not even thinking about it. And now we've got all, it's like prize fighters. you got everybody standing in the way trying to protect their players so they can play longer and make more money. And it's all about money. That's what it is. And I think I, we see a shift in that coming where, where, where I know there was some talk when Nolan Ryan got back involved with the Rangers that they were going to start to do this kind of thing. Um, but, I mean, I, you know, I was doing some work in the Pioneer League this year. And, I mean, you know, there are guys down there. Now, they're not affiliated teams anymore. But there are guys down there throwing 115, 120, 125 pitches in a game. And you sit there and you say to yourself, huh, I wonder if that would happen if these were still affiliated players with affiliated teams? The answer is, of course not. Do you think that we will start to see a shift, or are we seeing a shift, to getting guys throwing more pitches in games or innings in a season? I think in general, yes. But I think that, again, I think, and I've watched this happen over the last 25 years, there's too much interference in professional baseball. Too many people that are calling the shots. The agents are calling the shots. It's just the way it is. Where the players go, how much they play. And don't get me wrong, I have tremendous relationships with many of these agents and, and that are doing things for the right reasons. But their job is to protect their players and get them to play as long as they can. So they jump in on all sorts of things. And, and the team has to listen because they're afraid that they'll lose the player. There's just too many outs for these players so i don't think that's going to happen at the major league level and i think it's a shame but there are a ton and i am one of them i think that the players and the pitchers they ought to throw more they ought to throw more effectively and longer you're right a pitcher throws six innings it's they consider themselves a complete game now you know you go back 15 20 years ago you had to pitch nine innings to to you know really wow that's that's really something how many I, I'm, i'd be curious to know how many guys threw nine innings in the major leagues this year not many. Um, before we have a little fun here, um, 
I, I, I want to ask you this. Why has there been, because you and I both know, you've forgotten more than I know about it, but every time I open a newspaper or read on the Internet where a pitcher has a shoulder injury as opposed to an elbow injury, and all of a sudden you go, oh, boy, th- this is, this is going to be rough. Why has there not been as much success? And it's not to say you can't have a successful shoulder surgery and come back and pitch. But why has there not been as much success on the shoulders as there has been on the elbow? The re- there's just too much involved with the, with the shoulder. You've got, to have, you've got to have enough motion in your shoulder to throw hard, but enough stability so it's not unstable. You've got to develop all the musculature around it. There's 22 muscles around the shoulder, and it's extremely difficult. I think one of the biggest problems we've ever, and, and again, I've lived through this, and I've gone through this circle, is the MRI. Because too many people are treating it. Everybody gets an MRI. I mean, it's amazing how naive people are in baseball, but they think every time you have an injury, you need an MRI, and they treat an MRI. You treat an MRI, you're over-treating people. And so when I started, we weren't doing a ton of MRIs on shoulders because we knew there wasn't much we could do surgically to help them, and a lot of these players are coming back. Then all of a sudden, the agents, everybody got involved, they got MRIs, show partial rotator cuff tears, label tear, whatever it might be, and before you know it, you're operating on them. And then you're operating on them, and the rehab was so... We don't even know if that was the real problem. And these guys would have a hard time coming back. And so now we're to the position where most of the time, unless you absolutely 100% know that this is the problem, this will fix it, you don't operate on a thrower shoulder. Whereas 20 years ago, we were, we were scoping everything and trying to fix everything. And we've learned that you can't do that now. I mean, the thrower's shoulder is supposed to look like this after so many innings. You can rehab it and come back and play but don't go jump to operating on it. And that's what experience will tell you. I see these young guys that come out and take, they start taking care of these professional teams or get, they're sending me MRIs and they say, we're going to fix this guy's rotator cuff. And I look up and say, you're crazy. I mean, this guy's not going to come back. And the last thing you want to do as a surgeon taking care of a team is be the last guy to operate on that player. That's the last thing you want. All right, let's have a little fun here. I mentioned earlier that uh, that somehow, some way, uh, you're down there at Riverfront Coliseum, the old Riverfront Coliseum, uh, when all these rock and rollers are coming into town through the years. I mean, you, uh, it, the pictures around your office of the guys that you've been around is just unbelievable. The, the one that I find most fascinating, and, and, and please share the story, is, is when you had to come down and check out Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, and the Rolling Stones one night. What was that like? First of all, let me tell you, when, when, when you, again, I, I love the competitiveness. And when I came back to town, I'm, you try to find an angle. And so I said, you know, I want to come down to the Coliseum and I'll take care of all the acts that come down. And nobody was doing that. Nobody wanted to go down and they didn't, but I thought it was fun. And so I got to meet everybody. This was way before things changed in, in medicine and HIPAA and all that kind of thing. I was down there two hours before concerts. Um, and I was meeting everybody. So I'm, I'm operating at the Good Samaritan Hospital. And the Rolling Stones were coming to town for the Voodoo Lounge Tour. And they were playing at Riverfront Stadium. Well, granted, most of the time you see these acts and you're seeing somebody who's on the, you know, making a stage and they break their thumb with a hammer or something. So I'm up there and they said, we need you to come down to the stadium to, to see somebody with the Rolling Stones Tour. And I said, okay. And they said, well, we need an ear, nose, and throat doctor to come with you. And I said, okay. And so I found my, my, my buddy and we drove down. And so we drive down to Riverfront Stadium and every go underneath the bowels. And then all of a sudden, all, it's all draped out in black and there's pinball machines. And we go into this little room and there's this little old guy sitting in the corner. It was Mick Jagger. And I went and sat right next to him and he's talking to him about his throat. And I'm looking at IE and T guy going, this is out of my league. And so he looks at me and goes, go get some hot water and some this and this and this. And I go get it. And we sit in there taking care of Mick Jagger, just talking to him. And Mick Jagger looks at me and he says, uh, would you like to have dinner with us? And I said, are you kidding me? So we go out into a table and I'm sitting here, Mick Jagger sitting next to me. Then all of a sudden here comes Keith Richards. The whole band is sitting at this, this table of, for four, there's six of us. All they wanted to know about was ACL injuries and soccer players. And all I wanted to know about was him and David Bowie and all these things I read in the newspaper, Bianca Jagger. He was awesome. 
he was awesome. And he said, uh, can I pay you for this? And I said, how about a, how about an autograph program? He had all the guys personally sign an autograph and I still have it. And it was fantastic. I mean, he gave me tickets to sit behind stage and watch the concert, watch these guys uh, during and, you know, quite honestly, they're just regular guys. I mean, he was just sitting there. He was just a regular guy. Wanted to know what I did all day. All I cared about is what he did. And, you know, I got to meet Reba McIntyre, uh, Alan Jackson. You know, I remember Ozzy Osbourne told me to F off because I asked him if he's going to bite a bat's hat off. I was having dinner one night down and there's this guy sitting across from me and he was in a painter's uh, you know, overalls. And I'm ta I'm sitting here for 20 minutes having dinner. I finally said, what do you do? And he goes, I play in a band. I said, who are you? He goes, my name's Eric Clapton. I said, oh, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Did you meet the band Kiss? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kiss, Kiss, Kiss was down there. Uh, and those guys were nuts. I mean, they were absolutely nuts. And they're running around with their moon boots on. They're and there, and, but I was just one of the guys. I had been down there when Kiss was down there. I was down there two hours before, so I saw them out of makeup. I saw them just hanging out, running around, doing their thing. So I was just part of the gig. So they didn't care um, what I did. Uh, and so that's how you got into. You got to really see what was happening. I remember Fleetwood Mac uh, came with. They had renovated the Coliseum, and I got locked in the dressing room with Stevie Nicks, and she went berserk because she couldn't get out. It was locked on the way in and she would, she had a major meltdown. I mean, the wrestlers that would come were incredible. I'll never forget uh, uh, one of the wrestlers named Ivory uh, was a woman wrestler, cut her eye. And I, I was down underneath, I was gonna sew her up and here comes Ric Flair busting through the door saying, wait a second, who are you? I said, oh, I'm uh, gonna sew her up. And he goes, let me get my plastic surgeon from Columbia University on the phone. I'm thinking it's nine o'clock on Thursday night, good luck. Uh, here comes McMahon's daughter. Finally, I ended up sewing up Ivory. And Ivory said, what do you need? She signed a picture to me. And that's the same time when Cole Stone was there. So Cole Stone broke a beer can over his head, split it 12 stitches. And I got a picture of him too. You know, hell yeah, Doc, 15 stitches or whatever. I mean, it's just, the real, again, it's about building relationships. And, it, you know, I was just one of the guys. It was fun. That's cool. Tim, we thank you for your uh, time today. Uh, it's always great seeing you. Please tell your bride and, and all the kids that we said hello, and, and thanks so much. And thanks so much for your support of, uh, of high school athletics right here on Chatterbox Sports. You've been a big part of our base and our future, and, and we thank you for everything. Well, I appreciate what you do. And, and, and again, the, the, the guys at Chatterbox have been fantastic, and what you guys are building here around is going to be replicated around the country. And, it just shows how important and how exciting and how, uh, you know, high school sports is a big part of our communities, all of our communities. And here, uh, high school football, soccer, and it's just fun to be part of it. And, and I'm glad that I'm, I'm, I'm able to do so, and I'm glad that you guys include us in those things. So thanks, thanks for having me. This is great. All righty. Dr. Timothy Kremchak. Have a great day, young man. Great to have him. Boy, that's some interesting stuff on there, man. Interesting stuff. And